Welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is a longtime friend. It's been like like 15 years, I think we've- At least. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, Doug Many Ware, who's a, he is a consultant, an AI and machine learning expert, and the founder of Illuminotion. Hello. Welcome, Doug. Hey, Christian. How are you doing, man? I just want to point out, you can see my- uh, Arrow garden behind me, and those dead plants are uh, dill seeds, and uh, um, and an actual dead plant that's holding up another plant that I can't figure out how to extricate the <laughs> old one. And I just haven't gotten around to it. Well, I can yeah. see it, and I'm like, somebody's going to be like, he has a dead plant behind him, and I, I sort of do, but there's a live plant in there. Too. You, you need awesome. to go in there manually with like the little scissors and just and manually just slowly prune away. And this then room have... has, this room has like six of those gardens and another big one in it. I'm growing tomatoes and peppers and all sorts of I, stuff. So it's like easy to procrastinate the care of one because there are so many others. <laughs> I, I, I tell you, I, I miss having my garden, my last house where I had my raised garden, automatic sprinklers, but I, like that was my relaxation was going out. I didn't mind mowing the lawn and doing the hedges and cleaning up the yard, but spending time with the vegetables and weeding and uh, you know, around that. I mean, it's just, it, it's soothing to me. This is all about the bright lights and uh, the water pumps I've got on timers so that they don't, they're not all on at the same time and they sort of trickle and it's like having a fountain just keeps me zen. Uh, but also reminds me that I neglect things from time yeah. to time. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's <laughs> good to have things on your schedule and to task yourself with things that keep you on a schedule, especially working from home. That's like one of the secrets is that I... You know, I mean, you know this. I mean, how much I blog and 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 interviews that I do and all this stuff is is having a regular clip of these things fills out the edges as a schedule so that I'm, you know, as I'm working alone all day in the basement, me and my small dog keeps my sanity, you know, air quotes there. Well, but uh soon, but soon my uh my uh AI assistance platform will be reminding me of that. Uh and other things. And no, that's, and that is great. You know, it's funny that we talk so much, and I would like you to kind of give the background, like your background in your company, but we talk so much about in the space that we're, we're in and the Microsoft ecosystem that we've worked in. I know that you've, you're beyond that doing other things, um, but it, you know, so much around automation is around constant review and optimization of those things. It's finding what are the repeatable patterns? What can we go and do? And it's just, it's a natural step for us to then with, with the advances in technology with AI to start looking at how can I streamline, uh, you know, other repeatable tasks in my own life. I mean, I saw this about 10, 15 years ago with like Zapier and other tools to go and link different smart devices and mm -hmm. not just smart devices, but desktop applications and do more complex tasks and things. I mean, that's, Part of what I, I'm excited that, in fact, I was having a conversation yesterday, getting to the point, the vision of the future of AI, where it is almost like that, that service bus model, like you can plug different things that don't talk to each other yeah, in together. Exactly. It'll do the translation. It'll figure out what's needed to take your natural language or verbal command and then go figure out what needs to be done to make these things happen in a repeated fashion. Yeah, I mean, you know, so for me, it's, um, I thought there was a little video lag there, so I didn't mess anything up, but um, for me, it's it's about making it possible for me to get stuff done. It just wouldn't have gotten done otherwise, right? I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I mean, frankly, I'm not interested in the vision of AI where it replaces people and you just so many people to do stuff anymore. Yeah. Um, what good is that? What I want is for the AI to help me do everything better, more easily. Um, leave me in control and, and let me still make decisions for myself, right? So the, the kind of application that they're using, I mean, they're I'm using the GPT-4 models and amazing natural language processing. And if you, if you read my posts on LinkedIn, I'm doing things with audio and video and, you know, multimodal stuff. 
Um, but that's all about the stuff that's happening around me and that I'm doing. And I'm looking to wrangle that more efficiently, right? So uh, having, you know, a little piece of information over here and a little piece of information over here and a little piece of information over here. And um, each one of those, you know, if you think of those as products where they're like adding AI capabilities to them, I mean, that, that doesn't help me, right? Because yeah. I still have to go over here and then go over here and go over here. I want everything to just sort of me with me and have like a bunch of assistants that take away all the friction and, and also, you know, help me keep track of what I'm doing and remind myself of things. I, I passed a personal milestone this week. I'm going to celebrate. Uh, one thing I'm into, you know, is virtual reality fitness. Mm -hmm. uh, and my journey began five years ago. Uh, I started at 255 pounds. This week I weighed 199.8 pounds. It took Congrats. me five years of exercise. But wow. uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and part of that is that I've got, um, you know, one of these and I can see the chart. And if I'm, I was like, hey, man, you didn't sleep well. Uh, oh, you skipped two days of exercise or whatever. I mean, I need that. Yeah. I don't, I'm not looking for a machine master or robot overlord, but I, but, right. uh, I certainly can't have healthy relationships with the people around me if I put on that stuff on them. Like, oh, you know, to tell your wife to remind you to take care of yourself. She doesn't want to do that. But, right. you know, with the, this this topic and there, and I know that people have read it coming in, but, you know, talking about, you know, looking back over, and this kind of comes from our earlier conversation, you know, how the history of AI impacts the future of AI. It's right. um, something when you go in and when I, you know, talk to clients about, Copilot readiness, for example, and 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 just uh, and looking at automation of their administrative tasks across their collaboration, you know, platforms, which is in information management mm -hmm. systems, where I still focus my time um, are around that is that you part of that is you have to understand part of the history of that of how the tools work today to be able to understand what to go and build next. I think it's still. It, it, it's like the the people that talk about it replacing humans. Um, I mean, I remember 2015, I think, I was in an argument in a live broadcast with Naomi Moneypenny, who's at Microsoft mm -hmm. now, yeah. um, before she joined Microsoft, and talking about that that vision. And, and I said, I just don't, I don't believe AI will have the ability to replace humans ever. And I, I didn't entirely. And if we that. did, if it did, we wouldn't allow it to last for very long. Right. What uh, is that? Right. right. That, that's another great point. Yeah. You know, but, but she was just like, you don't, you don't understand, Christian, like how advanced some of the things are. I'm like, I, I said, no, it's, it's still a, it's a repository of the data of the information that we give it. It's limited to the commands that we allow it to go and do. Will it be able to do more and more complex things to put pieces together? Yes. But will that rival the human brain? I'm a doubter on that yeah but I it also goes back to the human nature aspect what will actually allow it to go and do that's right and i mean you know so not to throw shade on naomi's views from eight years ago right a long right. time ago right. but uh right now in the ai space there are a lot of people in line looking for the free lunch and they're expecting the lunch to cook itself yeah. right because they've seen oh the ai and like when you use it the first time it's amazing Right? Like that and Star Trek episode, computer, computer. Right, exactly. Computer. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, last, uh, was 18 months ago, almost two years ago now, when uh, GPT-3.5 came out, um, there was just an amazing amount of hype, and I, I started using it, and it was amazing. And then GPT-4, uh, chat GPT-4 came out, and, you know, I had an open AI subscription, uh, not long after that, and the advancement was so far, far and it was startling, and there were a lot of the claims. And so I had to, to preserve my own mental health, actually get in there and dig around and understand what was going on and start using it and start applying it because it was really giving me a lot of anxiety. Um, and, a, you know, a lot of what you see when you use one of those things is an illusion of lots of little, it's just traditional computing. Uh, with uh, of the large language model added into it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you talk to it, it's it's not remembering, the language model itself is not remembering anything. It's not learning anything. It's not really changing ever. There's a, a chatbot system that is storing the previous part of the conversation. And every time you send the next question to it, it's sending all the previous questions to it too, along with the system instructions. And so, um, and then the longer you talk, the maybe less good it gets until it completely 
falls over and becomes incoherent because the information that told it who it was and all the context of it has scrolled off the top. And now it's forgotten. But it, you see on your web browser or whatever, your user interface is the whole conversation. Why can't it remember what I told it? Well, it just can't because it's it's got this little box. So about that time, going back 18 months ago, we had this little box. And that box has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's huge amounts of competition in making the box of the size of the conversation bigger to the point where uh, it's gone from, if you were running a local language model on your uh, gaming computer, might be 2000 uh, would be the best you could do uh, running like uh, the original Llama model or one of those things. And even with GPT, the best one you could buy in the cloud might be 4K, right? Which is like six, eight pages of text. Now, uh, Anthropic and OpenAI, both between uh, Claude and uh, uh, ChatGPT and uh, G the GPT models, the context window is, in the, is over 100,000 tokens now, which is, you know, a few hundred pages of text that you can send to it all at once. Yeah. It still to this day can only respond with 4K of tokens, and so you can feed it. Um, yeah, and you're not going to see that bottom window where responds get bigger and bigger and bigger because the only reason they've been able to make the outer thing is because they've got algorithms that are plucking out and paying attention to the stuff that's contextually relevant out of that big thing. Into what you're so we're talking about the history of AI here. And that's why I want to start with that first thing is there's this window. And people don't hear about the illusion of the window, but the window is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's kind of plateaued. And all the research that's going on now in that space is are about working that window more cheaply, uh, more quickly, uh, more accurately, um, you know, and, th and there are other improvements that are being made. But the, the neural networks for these large language models, are, we're now in a, a phase where they're sort of becoming optimized, and that's a thing that, that's getting optimized. The other thing, so everybody's trying to make the window bigger. But the other thing is, in the last 18 months, it wasn't just, you've heard the term GPU core, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, that company can't do it because they're GPU core. They can't build their own models uh, or do this or do that. And uh, that's also true. But for those of us that are just using AI and building applications, I'm one of those. Like, I'm not Doug the data scientist. I'm Doug the system builder and the ISV. And to me, the generative AI are the pieces or components that I want to build into software solutions. Mm -hmm. And I'm not... I'm, I'm interested and I've educated myself to understand what's going on inside a large language model, but I'm not going to build one of those anymore than I'm going to build a database server. Right? I use databases all the time. I understand how they work and I can use them, but I'm not going to advance the state of the art in databases any time in my life. And I'm never going to improve anything about the building or retrieving of information from large language models. Mm -hmm. um, so the other kind of poverty was just access to a APIs that would let you use those. I mean, last summer, I was one of the cool kids because I had access to the GPT-4 models, mm -hmm. right? And then, you know, later on, I had access to these features and these other features because I'm in, uh, in, in different programs and I'm early adopting and I'm getting it. But um, a lot of the stuff that you see in use in a state of the AI right now, um, either didn't exist a few months ago, or even if it did, you maybe they didn't have access to it or couldn't buy it, or they could buy it, but they could only buy a little bit of it because it was so scarce. So this has been the age of, of scarcity uh, where all of this stuff is concerned. And that's why um, there are antitrust concerns about different big players. I don't know if you saw this, but Microsoft left the OpenAI board yesterday. I, didn't, I did not see that. They did, they left the OpenAI board and they left it because you know, there's, they have legitimate concerns that if they become a monopoly there too, that it's over and they're gonna get broken up. Yeah. No. Um, so, but, but you know, but Microsoft had access, they had those models. So um, now all these like little pieces are coming into play, but any application that you see that comes from a major vendor, big technology, by definition, isn't using any of that because it either didn't exist or they couldn't operate at a scale. Right. So uh, when we talk about and you can sort of see the history of it, if you used I'm sorry for the TED talk, but if you used um, chat GPT, you know, back when it came out in three, five or you used it, you're used to a conversational interface and you ask it a question and you get an answer. And, and in that era, uh, the question was, you know, what does it really know? What's it making up? Uh, like, how do we extend it? Doesn't even know what day it is. Like, those are common things that people would trick it because. Right. 
uh, all it was was the language model. So they started bolting, you know, capabilities on it. Um, first, they built plugins, right? And plugins let the you can go in and say, I want to use this diagramming tool, and I want to be able to use this uh, connection to Zapier to right. control other things, right? And you pick a couple plugins, and you can use them. And now it's doing tool calling. And in the mix, OpenAI added this thing called Code Interpreter, which is when it really started to become super useful because Code Interpreter, uh, what, the, what the AI does is it writes a program that it then executes in a sandbox. Mm -hmm. And um, you can do amazing, many marvelous things with, inside of code, code Interpreter sandboxes like generate Word documents or PowerPoint presentations mm -hmm. or Excel files or turn a PDF into text or take a, a piece of audio and uh, uh, extract text from it or do financial analysis or all these things. Anything that you can do with Python that doesn't require an internet connection that that has libraries for. Yeah. Um, you can well, do so now. Back have... to kind of what I was talking about is this idea of that service bus model, being able to communicate one place, one interface, and that it then through those plugins, through that sandbox capability is able to go and take that next step and take complex ac activities, create what's necessary to go follow up and do that task. Right. And so everybody's started trying to do that um, and to different degrees of success because it requires a really good language model, which is expensive to run. Mm -hmm. And so they still have those operational concerns. And so you see consumer products that are sort of aimed at people being able to build things like Copilot Studio. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Copilot Studio is a fine product for building Power Virtual Agents. And in fact, they changed the name of it. It's a low code solution. And if you read how it works, it uses natural language understanding. So what it does is you ask it a questions and it uses an older type of AI uh, that tries to classify what you asked into a topic. And it goes into that topic and tries to follow a flow chart and they've sort of bolted, you know, drilled a hole in the side of it and they have it talking to the better AI services. But what you're building with it is still very much in that vein. And the reason for it is because the large language models blow up all software everywhere, right? They like completely change how you can think about it. And anything that has not been written in the last couple months, by definition, can't have those user experiences because it yeah. wasn't possible. Yep. Um, and they also have to be able to operate at scale. And they also you know, can't go to their uh, people that funded the product that they built and go, you know, this thing came out with this large language model and now our entire design is wrong. It doesn't make any sense in the context of this new invention. Um, so now we're at this point where it's going to be interesting to see if Microsoft and other incumbents with existing packages and software, how they're going to navigate that and how they're going to avoid being, you know, gobbled up from below. Um, with Copilot as a product and something that you use in Teams or something that you use in Word, or something to use in Outlook or Windows or whatever. Each one of those things has its co-pilot, but they don't talk to each other. They don't know anything about the task that you're doing. And you have to go to each one of those assistants in the place where they live and work with them, right? So it's not your airplane, right? You're the co-pilot, you're, you're the co-pilot, right? Because it's not your airplane. If it was your airplane, you'd just be like, hey, uh, I need the Outlook helper to come over here and help me do the thing that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so those kinds of systems you're going to start to see emerge. Uh, that's the sort of product uh, that I'm building and um, is, you know, and it's, it's for doing all those things Copilot do, does, but it's in one task oriented uh, uh, operation. So you find a, an email that somebody sent you and have it read to you and go search for the information that answers that email and then uh, create a Word document and then email that Word document to the user and then schedule a meeting to follow up on it uh, in Teams. And you can just do that from your keyboard looking at one thing and then have a history of that as opposed to, you know, I did a thing in this app, I did a thing in this app, then I went and did a thing in this app and I did a thing in this app. And you go, well, what happened? Well, I can't really tell you what happened because I did a bunch of different things, which means that, you know, I can't have a macro level assistant, which yeah. takes us to this next thing that, you know, so how do you solve that? Well, one way you could solve it would be to build a product like Recall, right? And I don't know if, you, if, you, if, if, you're, if everybody's listening to this knows what Recall, uh, 
was gonna do. I don't think I think recall is dead. DOA. Well, that, right? well, that's the thing. I mean, yeah. It, for those that don't know what what it was, so my, Microsoft. But for, it, it made me think of the what was the Windows feature um, that allowed you to scroll backwards and see what was on my oh, desktop the, at five p.m. yesterday. Like yeah. I closed stuff down. I forgot what that is. So that that's what came to mind with this. But that it's constantly basically basically recording all the things so you could go back to a snapshot in time around that. And of course, people, anybody with governance security background is like, whoa, right. whoa, 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 what, what is this? How does this work? What are you talking about? And I think it was um, a, a, a blend of Microsoft pushing forward on something that some people are like, yeah, really cool. And I love what this does with um people that don't understand the history of why we had right. lockdown systems and all the other yeah. issues around that. Yeah, I mean, it's an obvious and clever solution to the problem that is completely unacceptable. It, the yeah, it's the- I mean, you, you can't know, solve it could, that way. Could we build this? Yes. Should yes. we build this? Probably not. Right, yeah. Well, nobody would let us run it. I mean, it's just, it's an absolute, it, you know, your employer is like, oh, you, we're looking at one customer's agreement and then you had a conversation with another customer and it just both got recorded and they're intermingled. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you had this, remember you had this complaint with Viva Insights and with what the analytics tools where Microsoft took great strides to uh, comfort people to say like, no, smaller organizations, it's anonymized the data, you can't look at individuals, so you can't do that kind of tracking. Like I, at 3.15 p.m., you were reading this email, and then I see you went over to Facebook, and then you went and did this. No, it, it, it anonymized- Oh, no, worse, you were reading this email about this customer's information while talking to this other customer. Right. But you know, mean, so, so that level of spying, you know, internal spyware, if you what you know, that's my words um mm -hmm. but you know that you know it got shut down i mean people complain they saw the problems with that you know hey the pe folks in the eu i mean working with clients and partners over that are subject to gdpr and other standards and other things especially working with like german clients um like yeah they're like no a uh, no we will never do this so that yeah, yeah so we yeah. yeah. So, so how do you solve that problem? I mean, you, so there's, you know, we need things at the operating system level applications need to support the, to support the kind of tool that I'm building right now. The one I uh, was describing with all those things, well, there happens to be MS graph, which has a very well defined security model. And I, and my application specifically can have permission to do those things. And I can have a governance framework around it and see what the stuff was and do security and isolate all that stuff. <coughs> Pardon me. You know, that in the context of a one-size-fits-all offering from Microsoft, that's a really, really, really hard problem that's going to take them yeah. years and years to build, even if the language models, you know, give the, give all their developers a, and makes them twice as good and empowers all the people. Um, it's still a big job, which is why I'm excited about this kind of AI, because, you know, it just, it, if, you, if you apply it correctly, it's completely virtuous and it has the ability to make everything better. Um, by improving the activities that we were going to have to do in anyway, it's it's there. I mean, don't get me wrong. There, in terms of automation, like I could write, I could build an AI right now today that I could put into a Sam getting a file from your company, and that file has data in it. It's been working great for three months. Okay, and then when all of all of a sudden one day the file import breaks, does something about your file change? Mm -hmm. okay. Maybe Dave added a page break or if there's a cover sheet on it now, or the columns slightly change order or whatever. I, I could build an AI uh, that say, hey, the file doesn't import anymore, analyze the file, what's different about it, up, update the script uh, to fix the format of the document, update the script, test it, does it import the file now? Yes, it does. Uh, have a human being review it um, and everybody wins. And so, you know, does that uh, impact an activity that a human being uh, did yeah it does but you know if I'm an analyst or a customer service person or a doctor or a lawyer um, and I have access to these tools to just make everything that I do better that's mm -hmm. you know that's the vision maybe I'm Pollyanna um, but going back to the to the windows and the app and, and the different applications and the security and all that stuff I mean 
when I say that all software that we have now today is legacy, that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. It's not that we built it wrong, and it's not that uh, uh, anybody made mistakes or anything else, but today things are different. Today, we can have a user speak and have an agent perform a complex task based on what the user wanted them to do in a way that we couldn't do before. We can put a pair of uh, glasses on a blind person with a camera and a mic on the front, a microphone on the stem that reads the room to them and tells them who's in it and tells them where the elevator buttons are. We could mm -hmm. do something in the opposite with an AR display that tells a, a deaf person what is being said to the person that um, they're speaking to in front of them. Yeah. Or and probably the give them an effortless... We probably have the way right now to extend that to make speech come out of that deaf person in real time without them having the ability to speak. Well, I mean, well that's, I mean, you think about that too. I mean, with, with, if we've seen, uh, you know, I've seen demos, I've seen videos of like, there was a company that had, you know, powered by your mobile device. And of course you got to make sure you got 5g the entire time, but as people in real time are talking in a different language, it's doing the translation and feeding it in. And likewise, if you, you know, you, as you respond back to that and can turn your phone around to the person that doesn't have a headphone, a Bluetooth or, you know, on that, they won't have quite the real time experience, but then do the translation back. Um, I mean, we are very close to the Star Trek communicator, like, you know, of that. That's right. right. And it's going to be tailored to you and whatever your stuff is. I mean, the, you, you, you thought if you think the mobile phone or the tablet challenged the PC, you haven't seen anything yet, right? The, your interface device to how you perform your tasks, you know, in cyberspace or whatever you want to call it, is going to be personalized to you. And if you're um, a poor man in his 50s that needs reading glasses at 7 o'clock at night, it's going to yeah. be something that just knows that, hey, <laughs> Doug needs the type to be bigger now, and it, it adjusts. Or, you know, and... and it is not a stretch that, you know, the device I'm interacting could be like, oh, he's squinting. Yeah. Because I can see his face. He's squinting. He can't read this. I'm going to make it bigger or read it to him or whatever. I mean, these are all things that are becoming possible, which is why I'm having a hard time sleeping at night. And I'm so excited about my business because this is not, this is beyond the science fiction that I read as a kid. And it is actually, you know, really, really feasible. What we're Where we are right now is in the, uh, Atari 2600 oh. computer, you know, C64 age of this era, but it's beginning and it's going to go. Anybody that's in technology and is worried that they're going to be left with nothing to do is just needs to start studying and chill. Cause right now, I mean, jobs are going to it's gonna create other, other roles. No, I, but something that you said to Doug that, that I was thinking about, um, you know, uh, uh, you know how much technology is advanced and yet we're, we're running and there's certain circles as it, you know, as it goes faster, um, you know, in the early nineties being in the, you know, the data warehousing space. And a lot of what I spent the time on is that we work for companies, work for the phone company, um, state of California, healthcare systems, massive amounts of data, of user data. Um, mm -hmm. And of course that was even before we had all of the, uh, you know, the, the video, the audio, like the attachments, all the things. And so to have these massive databases um, that was just data now with everything else associated with it. But what we found is that um, uh, we, to make the, because of the limitations of the technology and, and we didn't have broadband and, uh, you know, when, when, if for organizations that even had internet, um, we would have to go and take that massive amount of data, go and work with one group of users within the, the, the phone company and create a subset of that data on a specialized on a data mart that was had their tools that we'd had to go in there and structure it to give them a performant result, you know, the, the tools that they needed. And then they'd come back and say, yeah, I know we just spent the last 30 days doing this, but we also need to join this other data from this other system. It needs to be part of this. Is that all right? In 30 days, we'll have it ready for you. That kind of thing. I, I felt like that same vibe when uh, in good, good and bad with like the announcement of, you know, the ability to go and create a co-pilot for a single SharePoint site. The good thing about that is I can, again, uh, instead of not knowing anything about building, uh, uh, you know, an LLM, um, being able to just to take the files that I need with the audience that needs to, to see it, put it into a SharePoint site, create a co-pilot specifically for that, and then being able to interface with it and transact with that. 
So then you're creating these silos, these specialized, these things that are highly performant on that data set, but then it gets to the larger question of what the true vision is long term. Like what is it? But I mean that's that's a good approach most of the time. Simply so we'll talk to the SharePoint people, right? Because we you know we're SharePoint people. Um, the the idea like I can point the LLM at the documents in the document library is you've been around long enough. Like I just want to move my file share to SharePoint, right? Yep. And so it's it's a uh, the, the, you know, those are some of those are people that are standing in line waiting for the free lunch, right? Because where and where you can play to to do the actual cooking is with your content management skills, mm -hmm. right? Because that the information that the bot is using needs to be managed, needs to be right, 100% accurate, not contradictory, mm -hmm. targeted, and perfect. And uh, so the the one who goes, I'm going to co-pilot my document library that has a thousand documents in it that are just, you know, a bunch of documents, that's not going to be successful and it's not going to be satisfactory because there's been no content management to prepare it for the consumer, which is the language model mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever that program happens to be. And so your understanding of how to do information architecture and decorate things with fields that further describe it and how search works, you know, that improve the, the content management, the findability of the information is what's going to make it work. The, yeah. The more general and big the use case is, the less likely to the point where I could almost have a conversation, I think, with anybody at this point, having done enough POCs and been around, to be able to say within a minute or two, yeah, it's going to be Copilot Studio will be a fit. You could, it's feasible with Copilot Studio or, you know, don't even try it until you've solved this problem and this problem and this problem. D Doug, do you see that people are, I'll give you my my experience talking with people, like being in this space, being in the governance space a SharePoint Teams guy um, you know, around these information management systems. Um, do you think that people are starting to understand that they need to do that data cleanup and ongoing management of their data to make sure that those AI solutions perform? Or do they still see it as shove my content over here and magically this AI interface will be able to interpret, synthesize, know what I'm asking, give me back exactly what I want. So I don't think the conventional wisdom is wise yet. Um, I'm talking to more and more people who do understand that, but they understand it because they tried it. Yeah. Not because um, everybody, you know, because we were educated. And, and that's when I said we're in the C64, you know, sort of days. I mean, uh, people have to keep in mind, right? We're inventing the best practices as we go and the best practices get invented by failure. Right. That's what justifies them. If, uh, you know, if you can't actually say why you're doing it, it's maybe not a best practice. It's just a thing that you thought you might need to do. Well, right? I, I, I'm hopeful that with people, because there's a lot of, uh, I've run into very few organizations that are, that talk about co-pilot, um, moving into production. Everybody's piloting. Everybody's piloting. And they understand that. So I, I think there is, again, this is my, biased uh, experience in the space that I'm in with my, my background, um, but that I'm seeing more and more people that are finally getting on board that understanding that co-pilot readiness, preparing for it means that we have to go back and do everything we've been telling them that they need to do around search for their, their platform, their right. environment, you know, over the last 20, 25 years. In fact, there's some, the language that I use in the conversations that I have I was having these back in the late 90s, early 2000s when I was working with IBM and talking about, you know, back into my data warehousing days of like, you need to classify, you need to label, you need to structure, you need to know what your data is. You need to clean out, purge your system of the irrelevant old data that will skew the search results. Like it's an oh, ongoing still library sciences type approach to manage. That's right. And it's not... Yeah, and that's why there's no there's no free lunch. There's no click. The, you know, we we were in the days of button one click, form wizard. Um, if you're old enough to have any idea what I just referred to, then uh, rock on Gen X. But um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know the uh, it's uh, and so that's what has to emerge. And so the the and that's another reason why I'm excited. You know, and as far as the history of the business goes, when I decided I wanted to be in the AI business last summer, you know, after having spent six months of sleepless nights studying and playing with products and whatnot, I still 
approach to this, you know, people be like, well, what does your business do? And I'm like, I'm not sure yet, right? I'm going to do consulting because I'm a, you know, a consulting guy. I'm going to build POCs for stuff. And a couple of times people approached me about things that they thought were going to take months or years to build. And I was like, no, thank you, right? Because we're, you know, we're all inventing it. So um, the most healthy thing that can happen is for uh, people to get real about and 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 begin to be able to discern what is true and what is false. Just like I said, when I was hearing the claims in GPT-3, five days, chat GPT, and I was first using it, you know, there you can easily find lots of people said, oh, you know, they invented uh, God and we're all going to be obsolete next week and um, posts about, look at the thing that I did that, that you know, in retrospect were obviously frauds, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of things like that. But I couldn't really evaluate, you know, any of that was, is this true or is that not true? And so if you're a business person, you're looking to buy some AI and you've been using um, GPT-4 and chat GPT and GPTs and whatnot, and you see Copilot and Copilot Studio, I, I, I can't say that Microsoft has oversold Copilot Studio. If you read the docs, it says what it does. And they've got articles about the trade-offs of it and whatnot. It's just that the people buying it don't have enough friends who have tried it. They haven't tried it themselves to to realize just how vast the difference and how utterly different the design is between this thing that has Copilot on its name and and this thing, which was, you know, ChatGPT. But mm-hmm. you can you can roll out a virtual assistant to ten thousand business users, or you know, to do customer service. And if if you build it right and you've done the work and the engineering get a good outcome you just can't have a conversation with it yeah and if you want to have the kind of thing that does have a conversation you want to roll it out to a mass audience you can't afford it right you have to right and so it, it the over time the you know those are going to come together right um and it's going to be fascinating to see i I've, I'm, I'm trying to be careful about what i say on linkedin uh and other places because I was really frustrated with Copilot Studio a couple of weeks ago, and I and I was like, oh, it's terrible. And I, several people reached out to me like, how can you say, you know, or you know, we're selling a lot of that, or you know, um, and I'm, and people from Microsoft were like, could you please give me your feedback on it? And I'm like, well, I was just a, I was just an end user who in that moment got a bug, yeah. and uh, that I and, saw that, that conversation with... by the way in Fabian's response, and yeah, yeah. but it, it's so it's it wasn't Fabian to... actually. I'm talking about Fabian. Yeah, Fabian. Uh, um, and like most of the Microsoft people individually or even out in public, I mean, he's, he's graph, he's office, right. And uh, people on the outside of Microsoft, you know, see it as a model. No, I'm talking about somebody that was in the co-pilot team, uh, okay. and somebody from a consulting company. That's a client who, who was like, you just, you just can't be saying stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, it's fine. It's yeah. fine. Nobody even knows what I meant. Nobody cares what I think, but, um, we need to have we need as a community to be having those hard conversations because the, what's going to happen is if enough people try it and fail then then the product will be tainted yeah right yep. and it's up to us to as the you know those people in the community who care about community to get the word out and help people not get eaten by wolves right? yeah you know it's funny i always use as a great parallel um to the to that point that segment of be careful, you know, like Microsoft needs to listen and sometimes move faster. So I always use the fact that uh, I still have my drawer right here. I've got multiple Zoom devices. As a music guy, I still get made fun of. It's still on my profile in a few different places that I'm still a Zoom supporter and they all work. I've got music in them. I, you know, like, yeah, I they were great devices. But they, they were fantastic devices that were just too, they were too slow to deliver that. In fact, there was a graphic that I used to love um, um, pulling up, and I've got it on my blog in several places um, where, uh, and I'll have to find it and provide a link in my, in the blog to this, this article. Um, But it was, it was basically that the longer that you take to deliver what your clients want, it doesn't matter if eventually you get there in the case of the Zoom, Like it was a far superior product. The software was fantastic for music. People who cared about music, the Zoom experience versus the crappy, still hasn't changed iTunes experience was awful. 
you know, just a list and, and clunky even yeah. then. Um, at, but in the Zoom was just a visual listening experience. It was just a fantastic device. But the longer you take to give people what they want, the less likely you'll hold on to them. They'll move on, even if you eventually you know, cross that 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 line and have a superior product. It can be too late. So there's, I, I get it that Microsoft understands some of that and wants to err on the side of moving quickly, delivering things faster, even though it might not be comprehensive, but then moving on before, like there, you always get that complaint. And certainly within the office world um, of why don't you spend time fixing this stuff you've already delivered before building the new features on. And it's like, well, there's a process of that. And eventually we'll fix those things, but we also have to be bringing in the new and, and innovating and stuff out on the front end to keep the whole thing moving forward. Yeah, I mean, and as a as a longtime Microsoft partisan and watcher, I mean, I'm not anybody ever gets the idea that I I like. I'm critical of Microsoft, and I'll say what I think, right? Yeah. But they're my people. I have a lot of friends that work there. My friends are in the community. They're my family uh, in that respect. And uh, and I, but it's going to be interesting because there's they own a lot of things that just don't make sense. In like, if you think about what a computer is going to look like. Uh, in X number of years. And so as they try to get to that organizationally, there's going to be a lot of resistance to say, you know, killing office. Yeah. I'm not saying that they should kill office, but I mean, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of things that are easier to do right now today with code interpreter in Python than there are in any of the Microsoft ecosystems. And it's because Microsoft sort of, they think petulantly as a result of the antitrust decree back in the day, um, made a point of malicious compliance with the we'll make it so that you can use the office stuff, right? which is why in that ecosystem we have vendors that will charge you ten thousand dollars a month to be able to generate word documents code interpreter can do that for free and i can you know and i can do that pretty quickly and that's just one dot of many uh that i can that i can put on the map and so it's going to take you know an amount of uh critical pruning and, you know, just radical transformation that I have never in my life seen a technology, a big technology company pull off. It's what took down, you know, IBM and Unisys and Wang and Xerox, I would say, and probably Hewlett Packard is, is you know, circling that drain. It's just all these titans. Um, it's going to be really, really fascinating to see where who the big names are 20 years from now because uh, I, I'm so impressed with how fast Microsoft has moved and how bold it's been. But I, as an engineer who understands what they have and what everybody else has, you, once you come to the conclusion that every is that all the software we have right now today is wrong, yeah, well, and and the way we build it is wrong. And I mean, oh, you, you, you go, I mean, this has been a popular topic. Is that you know one thing that Microsoft has has been you know part of the reason for their continued success has been the backwards compatibility, the integration across the various the tools and things, right. and and in the future, I mean, if I'm interpreting what you're what you're saying, reading into this is that they they need to be more like Apple, which like the next version comes out, there's no, like you, you move over, it's a migration rather than an upgrade. Um, because it's just a different product. It works differently. It's, it's a whole different form factor, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. But at, at least they could hold the line with, uh, you know, the desktop experience is way better than the phone experience because of the form factor. Yeah. But we're also in a time where augmented reality displays and projection and computer vision and audio processing are advancing at such a rate that, the, that you know, we're, you know, it's, it, that, that little rabbit pin was silly, but the computer the form factor that we're used to right now is it will become a relic. It's going to dissolve. Yeah. All of them are going to dissolve, the, you know, and, and it's, it's going to be a, a personalized device that you probably have attached to yourself somehow all the time every day. Yeah. Or, or maybe the, or, or maybe the environment does it and does projection. I mean, you, we, yeah. they, I don't know, but I do know that uh, when I demonstrate my uh, product to people, I use the microphone to do the input because I can input faster by speaking than I can by typing. Even after yep. ri having written thousands of pages and having written books and whatnot, I'm a crappy touch typist, yeah. and I can I can speak way faster. Yeah. And, it, and so, if it's 
punctual, punctuated correctly and capitalized and looks right, it is right as far as I'm concerned. I don't care. I'll say that I, I'm glad with this advance in technology because I never learned to touch type. I'm like my, you know, I'm a, you know, <laughs> these five fingers. Um, I, can, I can I do can it pre pretty quick. Um, and I could do a bit of the touch. My, my, my spelling quality drops off considerably, but the, but you're right. I mean, I, I can, I, so I still, like, I still have notebooks. I can write faster and get my ideas down than opening up, get, turning to a keyboard. Um, yeah. And I mean, so if you don't have to worry about the medium of you putting information in and you like, as you're writing, you could be like, read that to me. And then it comes out of your speaker. Yeah. Or whatever draw a picture of that right uh, well i should also want to like my, my daughter my oldest uh she always had um you know the stylus on whatever her laptop or or, or she's a huge surface pro fan um the quality of that and so and she was sitting there taking notes and i'd like i didn't even realize how advanced it had become until i watched her with her device and writing notes and some cursive and some of the things that she was doing and she's a scientist and data scientist now and so she's doing calculations other stuff and then it picks it up and but I'm like wow i just i didn't realize it was there yet i thought it was still kind of a novel it is thing. yeah but I mean, and that's a, that's the thing that I've been saying uh, uh, now for years. And, and it, it, the language models didn't exist. I mean, independently of that, all the other machine learning stuff. But the reason that I was able to take up language models quickly was because I had ordered a you know very expensive desktop um, with a game you know with an RTX forty ninety, and it was pre ordered. And I bought it because I wanted to do a uh, computer vision, um, 3D work orthographic mapping with yep. my drones. Yep. I wanted to take, you know, and uh, I haven't used it for that at all. I've, <laughs> I'm doing lots of other machine learning stuff, but uh, you know, at that time, it was obvious to me that the form factor itself was gonna go away and, when the, and, and the missing piece was natural language to understand. Yeah. Right. Uh, up until that point, you couldn't, yeah, we had, I mean, we had all that stuff on the table was said, but what you can do with GPT and Claude and Llama and Mistral, and I mean, there's a lot of competition in the space. Yeah. Um, that you can do today, you couldn't do at all three years ago. It, you, it wasn't, you couldn't do it well, or that you had to work really hard to do it. It was impossible. Yeah. So, uh, it this is going to be it's just uh, you're right i mean we were talking about it's funny before we started recording we were doug and i were talking about how i was like we're talking about the, the history of ai and, and how important it is to understand some of that history to know what's possible and where, where it's going and when we talk about history of ai i mean yeah yeah there's been things that have been around bots i mean I, the, 10 years ago was talking with a good friend of both of ours who went in and started building bots like sold his other consulting company um, and then went and was building bots in the healthcare space and, and do that. And it was basically just like a bot front end to a knowledge base, you know, it was still fairly scripted and structured around that. It's fantastic. And he did well, I think he may have even sold that business. Um, but you know, we're really talking about history of the last 18 to 24 months. We're not talking about the last 20 years for a lot of this It's moving that fast. And so. Um, to, to even sit here and talk, I mean, it's, it's fascinating just to watch the announcements, try to, I don't try to go out. I'm not experimenting like you with all of those other competing AI platforms from the, from the Microsoft ecosystem, but I read a lot of things. I understand a little bit of what I read, um, but do try to kind of keep up on like what's happening and how fast that space is, is maturing. Um, but it, yeah, it, it's, uh. I just keep telling customers, I said, if you're not currently piloting, you need to be piloting, trying things, whether you ever roll it out or not, but you piloting so that you have an understanding of where things are going will help you better make that transition when eventually we'll be forced to make change. Oh, and then again, all the people that are working in SharePoint and Teams and that are in the Microsoft ecosystem and are on Azure are in a fantastic place because you know I could level as many criticisms as I want but that is the best place to go like if you want the most stuff um, uh, you, you know there are things that get more press than other stuff but Microsoft research is pumping out stuff all the time you can run an AI studio 
all those models that I had just mentioned, uh, you know, when OpenAI uh, has been releasing stuff, it's within a week or two, maybe a month of it appearing on Azure. Yeah. Um, and if you've got, you know, an MSDN subscription if that, or Visual Studio subscription, whatever it's called these days with those Azure credits, mm -hmm. you know, you can, uh, you can do everything. No, there's not a user interface, right? You'd have to build that, and that's why, part of why I'm in the business. But, uh, you know, there are playgrounds in, in Azure where you can you could do all that and always have access to, to really good stuff. And on top of that, you're the people who understand information architecture and being able to slice and dice and know how the information is moving. Um, a lot of these things out of the box um, are, when you look at them, are, you know, they're... Not, I'm not going to say they're security nightmares, but they're from a security and compliance standpoint, they're woefully inadequate for right. what people really need. And well, somebody's got to build all that stuff. But, right. So the, the, while the, everybody's standing in line for the free lunch, you have an opportunity to be back in the kitchen uh, cooking it. And well, that's, it's, by, by the way, not free. They're yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there's, that's, uh, uh, again, that's why one of the benefits of the Microsoft ecosystem, like you point out, is it's the business application of those things. While it may feel sometimes like, on those advanced the innovation, the, the, the features. No, I mean, they're out the forefront in a lot of different spaces, um, but from an enterprise, a business perspective and how it applies to what you could actually be using, incorporating in, and again, having integrations, have you know, across with your productivity tools, the, with Teams and SharePoint and kind of the other things where your, your knowledge assets are. I mean, that's a pretty compelling story, um, but, that's why I would say, like, go out and experiment. I mean, I occasionally see on the consumer class of other AI tools and things come out. I go and I investigate. I'm aware, like, hey, that's really cool. Then I go back and look at, hey, is there something similar in the Microsoft space? If there is, how does it, you know, compare in the, the features there? And, and then look at some of the conversations. And a lot of times it's like they'll say, oh, we really like this, but here's the security issue with this. And here's the concern here. This is why we've not moved in this direction. So I appreciate that. that. Yeah, if you're worried AI, if you're in that space and you're worried, is AI gonna put you out of business or, you know, is it gonna replace you? You are more, you're in a better position than nine out of 10 other people that are in the technology industry because, <laughs> so my favorite podcast is 99% Invisible and 99% Invisible has been doing this book club about a book called The Power Broker written by Robert Caro. Uh, which I highly recommend the podcast and the book, which was published the year I was born. Um, but they've been using, they, they talk about how the guy got his power and you should not in your grand scheme of things in your life, try to be like Robert Moses, because that's why it's an interesting story. Uh, but, but uh, <laughs> the acronym, they made up an acronym, which they call nipples, the noticeable improvements in people's lives. Right. And you, you have the position to, to, to create noticeable improvements in people's lives because their email is in M365. Their meetings are in M365. The documents that they store that have the things that they care about are in M365, which is in the Microsoft ecosystem. And so when those, those people need assistance, they need assistance that work with them and where their stuff is not something that's outside of that whole ecosystem that's trying to take over the world. Right. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.